Jordan Davis is one of the most valuable players in this entire draft class. I know that might sound weird to say because to some people, they just see him as a nose tackle, but to be honest, he is not just a nose tackle. That would be like saying that Derrick Henry is just a running back or that Jameis Winston is just a shellfish enthusiast. Like technically you would be correct, but they're also so much more than that. As somebody who's covered the NFL for over 10 years at this point, Davis is easily one of the most rare human beings that I've ever seen enter the league. And that is saying a lot. And so today what I want to do is explain why the Eagles traded up to 13th overall for Jordan Davis. We're going to talk about the scheme implications of that pick and all the various roles he's going to play next to Fletcher Cox and Javon Hargrave. And honestly, the rest of that D-line rotation, which is nasty. And we're also going to talk about why ultimately, regardless of whatever price, how we paid to go get Jordan Davis, it was probably worth it. Also, by the way, I have a very special drink for this week's show. Longtime viewers know that I like to come up with a new cocktail recipe for every single episode. And this one is by far one of my best. And I created it in partnership with the fine folks over at Bushmills, who just newly released their Bushmills Prohibition Recipe Irish Whiskey, which is a much proofier version of the Bushmills you know and love. And they did just release this Prohibition recipe to celebrate the final season of Peaky Blinders, which coincidentally is also one of my favorite shows. So doing this was a little bit of a dream come true for me. I call this drink the Garrison for obvious reasons. And to make it, you need five ingredients. You need four dashes of black walnut bitters, one bar spoon of ginger infused honey, a quarter ounce of green chartreuse, three quarter ounces of Amaro di Angostura, and of course, the centerpiece of it all, two whole ounces of Bushmills Prohibition Recipe, which again, unlike most other Irish whiskeys, is a little bit bolder and a little bit proofier, which I happen to prefer, since it doesn't get lost in any of the other ingredients. You stir all of that over ice and then strain it into a rocks glass, and you have yourself a drink that will punch you right in the face, but still be your best friend, just like Tommy Shelby. You can enjoy Bushmills Prohibition Recipe either in a cocktail like this one or on the rocks or neats or however you prefer your whiskey. I am not one to judge and I'm not one to tell you how to drink it. But if you want a bottle for yourself, you can go get it at Reserve Bar in the link in the description down below. That is an online retailer for premium spirits or limited edition bottles like this one. So get it while you still can because it is very very good whiskey. Thank you to Bushmills for sending me these bottles and allowing me to experiment a little bit. I had a hell of a lot of fun doing that and I really appreciate it. But with that being said, why don't we get to what you're all here for, which is film study on Jordan Davis and in particular talking about what he brings to the Eagles defensive line. The main value that the Eagles get with Davis is ironically the same value that they got with Fletcher Cox when they first drafted him many years ago, and that is positional and front versatility. People see Jordan Davis as quote unquote, just a nose tackle, but in reality, he's also a three technique. He's a two eye, he's a four eye. He can play five technique if you really want him to. He can do any interior spot you want up and down the line of scrimmage. He's got the strength, length, quickness, balance, flexibility, burst. I mean, every trait you could ever desire. So categorizing him as just a guy who can sit in the middle and take on blocks as like a true zero technique, a la Vince Wilfork, that's just not really an accurate portrayal of what he can do, and it's selling him extremely short. Obviously, yes, he can play a zero technique in a base 3-4 front, or be like a tilted nose tackle in a base 4-3, and he'll be really, really good at that. But it's what he does in nickel personnel as occasionally a three technique that is actually valuable. When you watch his film from Georgia, they played a lot of what they call flex fronts out of sub packages like nickel for that reason, because in those flex fronts, they knew that they could rely on him to make plays as either a three technique or as a quasi nose tackle playing two eye technique on the guard, because he had the quickness and the balance to still make plays from both of those spots, no matter where the call was on any given play. I'll give you an example of that. We'll start out with him playing nose tackle in nickel personnel, which again, in their four down nickel fronts for Georgia, their nose actually played in a two eye technique lined up on the inside shoulder of the guard rather than lined up over the center. And the reason why they used him as a two eye in these flex fronts is that from there, he can actually play both a gaps while also covering up one of the primary weaknesses of this front, which of course is the B gap bubble. If you're only playing five guys in the box with two high safeties behind it from nickel personnel, mathematically speaking, there's always gonna be a bubble in the defensive front somewhere, meaning an uncovered gap. 
And most run games at any level of the sport are usually going to try to attack that bubble in any way they can. So that's a huge threat to the integrity of the defense. For instance, Arkansas here is going to try to attack that bubble with a scoop block on outside zone. And best case scenario, maybe they can pop this run to the edge or bend it back inside the tackle into the B gap behind that combo block on Davis. And that's mainly what they're going for here. Attack the bubble, try to combo block Davis with that scoop block and just ride him down the field. But here's the problem with this call for Arkansas. If the defense has a guy like Jordan Davis playing 2-I, who not only is extraordinarily strong at the point of attack, but who also has an absolutely wicked first step off the ball, he can do things like this and read that block, react to it, and immediately widen himself far enough to square up on the guard with his hands already in his chest plate before the guard can even make contact. And with how unreasonably strong Davis is, if he's already squared up on the guard with his hands in his chest, the offense basically has no chance of making the scoop block work. So now at this point, the center is stuck behind traffic because the guard couldn't even make contact on Davis first, let alone land the block and work him down the field. And you can even see the left tackle recognize himself that this play has gone tits up almost immediately, so he tries to jam Davis back to the inside. But even that doesn't work, he just keeps running through it. So now you have Davis basically beating three dudes all at once here on a block that, to be honest, should be a lot harder than this for him to beat in the first place. By the time the running back gets going on his track, Davis is still ending up right where he needs to be, which is winning to the front side of the guard and holding down that B-gap bubble even through all of that garbage. So that forces the running back to now make a choice between taking an early cutback into the pursuit of the defense, or just putting his pads down and running into a brick wall that will get him nowhere anyway. If you really want to know what Davis brings to the table, it's that type of play right there that may or may not even go into the stat sheet. Georgia played light boxes all the time where the math was not in their favor to play the run well, but when you have a guy like Davis that can make up for being down by one in the box count and having uncovered gaps, well, it kind of functionally changes what a defense is capable of. His unique athleticism allowed Kirby Smart to be aggressive and call stuff that most defensive coaches, quite frankly, would not have the balls to call as consistently as Georgia did. He was, for lack of a better word, the great equalizer. And I'll give another example to show exactly what I mean by that in terms of having that flexibility to call more types of blitzes consistently. This is from the national championship game against Bama, so you know it's a very, very good offensive line. And Georgia is in a call here that they refer to as flex under Molly. And what flex under Molly means is that they're in a flex front, which again, their translation for a flex front is a three technique and a two I technique in a sub package with that three technique set to the weak side of the formation like a normal under front would be. And Molly is their term for this particular five man pressure with essentially cover one on the back end in coverage. Molly is always going to be called away from the side of the running back, and it's a variation of a nickel blitz that they call Ollie, where the slot defender would be the blitzer through the B-gap, except the blitzer now is the Mac linebacker instead, so they call it Molly. Mac plus Ollie equals Molly. You get it. And the reason why they love this call with Jordan Davis on the field as their three technique, especially in first and ten situations, is that it works really well against both the pass and the run. Georgia knows that Bama absolutely cannot run at Davis as a three technique with something like inside zone because he would totally dominate this guard one on one just like in the last play I showed you. So really Bama's only option here with the ground game is to try to attack this B gap bubble on the other side with some sort of run that can give them an extra blocker. Whether that's going super risky and pulling both the guard and the tackle and trying to back block with everybody else, or maybe just pulling the tackle on something like dart, or maybe folding the center around as a lead blocker, anything of that nature. But again, that's where the Molly call comes in because it brings that Mac linebacker aggressively right up that B gap to plug that bubble and wreck most of the runs that threaten this front. Plus, there's the added bonus that if this is a pass and not a run, you've got a linebacker now screaming up the B-gap right at the quarterback, away from the running back side, mind you, so it's a much harder block for him to make if he's trying to stay in and pick him up. So Molly is a great call all around because knowing that the offense can't reliably attack Davis's gap because he's just way too strong, Georgia can be the aggressors on defense themselves and attack from the other side. 
However, all that being said, what really makes Kirby Smart so confident in his ability to call Molly like this on first and 10 is that he knows that he can run it from either side if he really needs to. And so in cases like this, where Bama flips their back from one side to the other before the snap, and Georgia has to respond by flexing their front and switching the alignments of the three technique and the two eye technique, they don't have to get out of that Molly call. They can just flip their sides to match it and run it behind Jordan Davis now, knowing that Davis, even at 350 pounds, is just as quick as Devonta Wyatt is on the other side, so he is also perfectly capable of spiking all the way into the opposite A-gap across the center's face, planting that left foot to redirect his momentum, jamming his shoulder into the oncoming guard, and once again totally cutting off the path of the back with that quickness so that the back is forced again to cut into a wall of bodies for no gain. There are so many defensive coordinators out there that would not feel comfortable running this pressure to either side behind either of their defensive tackles, because generally a bigger nose tackle is not going to be quick enough to spike, redirect, and start to get upfield all in two steps like a typical undersized three technique can. But Jordan Davis is both a nose tackle and a three technique, so the direction of the call doesn't really matter. He can penetrate, he can loop, he can push the pocket, whatever you need him to do, he can do. So when I say that Davis gives a defensive coordinator more front versatility and more versatility in terms of the type of pressures they can call, all of these plays that you're seeing right now are the product of that versatility. He is Fletcher Cox 2.0 to me because he does all of the same stuff that Fletcher Cox does. And by that, I mean he does everything. So when it comes to how I expect the Eagles to use Jordan Davis and Fletcher Cox and where Davis's role fits within the whole defensive line room, honestly, I think it's going to be him and Cox on the field together on early downs because Jonathan Gannon, the Eagles defensive coordinator, will be able to move both of them around and confidently play any front he wants to in order to stop the run. And then on third downs, after Cox and Davis get the offense into ideally third and long situations, that's when you roll in a fresh Javon Hargrave and Milton Williams, who are both extremely athletic interior rushers. And Hargrave in particular is one of the five or six best interior rushers in the entire league. He was actually sixth amongst all defensive tackles last year in pressures at 63 total. And he also had double digit sacks as well, which is pretty rare for an interior rusher. So the ability to keep that kind of pass rush talent fresh at all times and just bringing him in in medium and long yarded situations to go hunt quarterbacks, that is great for the Eagles defense overall. There are just so many reasons why I love the Jordan Davis pick to Philly, but all of those reasons really come down to one thing, options. His pure talent gives this team options, and at least at the NFL level, options are a very powerful thing to have. Hopefully today's show helped the good people of Philadelphia to not panic when they see a quote-unquote low-value position get taken in the top 15. I know it's easy to say that defensive tackles are a dime a dozen and that you can find good ones under the couch cushions, which is not exactly untrue, all things considered, but every once in a while you run across one that is just different. And to me, Jordan Davis is just different. So thank you for watching this week's show. Thank you once again to Bushmills for sponsoring and allowing me to create this drink in partnership with them in celebration of the final season of Peaky Blinders. Uh, this was really, really fun to do, and I appreciate the opportunity. If you guys are big Peaky Blinders fans or just big Bushmills fans in general, again, go to that link down in the description below to get yourself a bottle over at Reserve Bar. It is very good whiskey, and I highly recommend it especially if you're making one of these. I'll be back next week with a brand new show and, uh, of course, a brand new cocktail. Not entirely sure what it is yet, but I'll figure it out. Until then, cheers.